Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Sammy Arnold, and I'm the executive director of the Japan America Society of Tennessee. And um, we exist to promote and support the relationship between the state of Tennessee and Japan. Uh, th th that simple. And um, of course, most of the time when we talk about that relationship, we talk about it in terms of all the economic capital that Japan has contributed uh, to the state, which is, of course, worth talking about because it's, it's a lot. But um, that only tells part of the story. There's, there's been also a great deal of cultural capital contributed as well. It's important to talk about both. Um, and that's why we're here tonight. We are here thanks to the very generous support of the Mitsui USA Foundation. Um, and I have a gentleman here, uh, Mr. Jaime Torres from the Mitsui and Company. Mitsui is a, um, a great Japanese company that we're fortunate to have here in Nashville. They have supported JAST for many, many years, uh, long before my time here, and we're thankful for them. And I would like to give an a opportunity to Jaime, the Deputy General Manager at Mitsui and Company, to tell you a little more about what they do. Thanks so much. Here's Jaime. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sammy, for allowing us to be here today. And uh, you know, what's interesting is, as soon as Sammy came up here on stage, the AC turned on, <laughs> and it felt like we were taking off, OK? So um, I will assure you, no doors will fly out, OK? We are safe. Um, but thank you for this opportunity. My name is Jaime Torres. I work uh, with Mitsui since the year 2020. Um, I was working previously with a Dutch company called Axon Nobel. Um, they specialize in paints and coatings. And prior to that, I worked with uh, Bridgestone Tire. And uh, with Bridgestone, I lived in Costa Rica uh, for seven years. So if you want to know a little bit about Costa Rica, let me know. Uh, seven years, you'd think it's a short time, but wow, it, it, we enjoyed it a lot. As we enjoy coming back to Nashville. Um, and the reason why we are here today, and it's great to be here at a bookshop, something that is disappearing from our fiber, uh, unfortunately. But I always enjoy going to different bookshops, and uh, I can't leave without buying a book. I have many books at home. Ask me how much I've read. Probably not as much as I would like to. But I'm here to talk a little bit about Mitsui. And for those of you that uh, have not heard about Mitsui, Mitsui is headquartered in Tokyo. It's a Japanese company. And it's one of the largest Japanese trading and investment companies in the world. Um, Mitsui's business focus is specifically on growth through traditional trading, business investment and management, and project development. Its diversified business portfolio spans 63 countries and regions, with over 500 affiliated companies, including 46,000 employees within 128 offices. Total worldwide revenue uh, during the last fiscal year, March 31st, 2023, was $106.8 billion. Now, Mitsui USA established its offices in 1966, is one of the largest wholly owned subsidiaries of Mitsui and Company, and Mitsui USA operates in the following 10 business areas, mineral and material resources, infrastructure projects, mobility, chemicals, energy, foods and retail, healthcare and service businesses, IT, financial and new business and transportation logistics. Its operations are guided by its diverse, distinctive corporate social responsibility policy, which emphasizes environmental and socially accountability and respect for the stakeholders and the community. The Mitsui USA Foundation is a philanthropic is the philanthropic arm of Mitsui and Company USA for active social contribution programs and communities where Mitsui does business. Established in 1987, it currently supports more than 50 initiatives across the US in areas of education, community welfare, welfare arts and culture, and employee matching and volunteerism with special emphasis on integrational education and US-Japanese exchanges. More than 50% of its grants targeted, uh, targets education primarily for college level via scholarship forums and Japan, and Japan research. With respect to the JAST events, Mitsui USA Corporate supports the Nashville Cherry Blossom Festival, um, the Women's Forum and Network Luncheon, and uh, the Mitsui USA Foundation uh, founded and supports 
these programs, which could be active or, or is in process of, the Mitsui USA Foundation Scholarship in Tennessee. It also contributes generously to regional programs that includes the Cherry Blossom Festival, which is about to, to come up pretty soon. Uh, the Tennessee Video Skit and Poster Presentation, the Women's Leadership Forum and Network Luncheon, the Memphis Japan Festival, and the Mitsui Lecture Series, and that's why we're here today. The Mitsui Lecture Series objective in its third year, in, and thanks to the support of the Mitsui USA Foundation, is to deepen the understanding of contemporary Japan and Tennessee and create a sense of community and exchange. Now, what better way to represent this sense of community than what we're doing today with Yurina Yoshikawa, who will be discussing three books, and I won't say the titles, I'll leave that to her. I don't wanna steal her thunder, where they'll be addressing the cherry blossom as the motif. So I hope you enjoy this evening. Sammy, thank you for your time and uh, have a great evening. Thanks, Jaime. That brings us to our very special guest, uh, Ms. Yurina Yoshikawa. Yurina is the Director of Education at The Porch. Uh, Yurina holds a Master of Fine Arts from Columbia University. Her writing has appeared in The Atlantic, NPR, Lit Hub, The Japan Times, and several other places. She was the winner of the 2020 Tennessee True Stories Contest and a 2021 recipient of the Tennessee Arts Commission. Yurina serves on the boards of two local nonprofits, the Nashville Philharmonic Orchestra in API Middle Tennessee. She hosts and curates the virtual book club for the Japan America Society of Tennessee that focuses on contemporary Japanese novels translated into English. She is also an associate of the US Japan Council where she is a co-organizer of their artists and creatives group. And I have been in this role for four and a half, five months, and so I have only had the privilege of knowing Yurina and her husband not very long, but I feel like we're friends already, and I'm thankful to have her here tonight, so I'll introduce Yurina. Thank you. I have a mic here. So. Oh. Yes. All right. Um, I believe I'm going to stand here, and uh, do we need to, can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Okay. Thank you all so much, and um, thank you to JAST. Definitely Sammy and Ginger, friends. Yes, we are. Um, the Mitsui USA Foundation, so glad to meet you tonight, Jaime. And the Consul General of Japan in Nashville for recording this lecture so that anyone can view this on YouTube at a later time. I also wanted to give a very special thanks to the bookshop right next door, as well as Hanabi Coffee Shop for hosting this today. This is a really special place in Nashville. Um, as Jaime mentioned, you know, uh, independent bookstores are such a precious thing these days. And the bookshop, curated by Joelle Herr, who she couldn't be here tonight, but um, she personally curates all of the titles that you see in there. It really feels like a little jewelry box of books. And um, this coffee shop, too, they have such a wonderful symbiotic relationship, which I wish all bookstores had. And, um, you know, I work remotely mostly for The Porch, which Sammy introduced. The Porch is a nonprofit organization that offers writing classes for writers of all stages and ages. So if you're ever interested in taking a class on poetry, memoir, or fiction, we have something for everybody. So I hope you can check us out. But anyway, I was going to say that more often than not, you can probably find me on one of these tables a few times a week just working on my computer and um, you know answering emails and then taking little breaks to just browse the books at the bookshop. So I just feel really selfishly uh, grateful that I get to do this event tonight here at one of my favorite places with some of my favorite people and organizations. So thank you. And um, yeah, so before we dive into the books, I just wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about the overview and context of you know, cherry blossoms in Nashville. Why are we talking about this today? So I'm sure you've all seen some on your way here this week. Even in some of these parking lots, I think you might be able to spot a petal or two, but um, we also have the Cherry Blossom Festival coming up in April. And I just felt the need really, um, you know, 
every time spring comes around and the cherry blossoms are in bloom, I'm gravitated towards books like the ones that I'm going to discuss. Reading books for me personally is a way of making sense of what's going on. And um, what's so beautiful about cherry blossoms here is that uh, they do such a immediate job of you know, curing a little bit of my homesickness. I am originally from Tokyo, Japan. I grew up mostly in California and spent my formative years in New York. But looking at cherry blossoms alone, it just takes me back to my childhood, to seeing my grandparents in the rural mountains where there were cherry blossoms everywhere, and we went to festivals together. And I'm just really happy that we get to enjoy them very casually here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of how that came to be. Um, I'm going to discuss three books tonight in very, very brief stints. <laughs> if there was no time limit, I could probably go on and on for three hours, but I'm glad that you're capping me at 30 minutes. Um, we're going to start a little bit uh, with the tale of Genji, which was written in the year 1000. And the second book will be the Makioka Sisters, which is from the mid 20th century. And then the last book, is a very precious book to me. It's called The Housekeeper and the Professor, written in 2003. So we're gonna span a little bit in time throughout a millennia, so bear with me. Um, I wanted to mention too, especially since the bookshop is right there, that we currently live in an incredibly lucky time as readers. There are so many talented and accomplished translators who are hard at work right now translating works from all different cultures and different languages. I can only speak for Japanese because I speak that language and can compare the original text with the translations, but my gosh, these translators, they get the authenticity and the nuance perfectly. And um, I feel that, you know, books are a way of getting to know someone else's culture. Books are a way of getting into someone else's worldview. And when the translations are so good, you actually don't even need to know much about the topic. You don't need to be a Japan expert. You don't even have to have gone there or know anybody. You can pick up a book, immerse yourself immediately because of the work that the translators are doing. And you know, my hope is that if you were ever feeling intimidated by some of these translated books because you thought, oh, like I might need to know X, Y, and Z before diving into it, I just want you to let go of that you know, a little bit, and to trust that the translators are going to take you there and to, you know, provide all the context you need and to, you know, share with you a universal human experience. I could go on and on about that alone, but um, one last thing. So why are cherry blossoms such a big deal in Japan? In the beginning of time, Cherry blossoms were actually only visible in the high mountaintops. And it is recorded that in the ninth century, the Japanese emperor and the court at that time, they decided, we want to look at those cherry blossoms in our own gardens. And so they sent people to chop down those trees and the saplings, bring them to the middle of the imperial gardens. And that's, that's how they were transplanted there in the ninth century. And for a long time, the earliest books, like the tale of Genji and poetry, it was really only written by people you know, who were in that world, that elite exclusive world. And when they wrote about cherry blossoms, it was because they were there in that garden. That was only you know, for the very top of society. Skipping forward, in the 16th century, when feudal lords, who are very powerful samurai, like Toyotomi Hideyoshi, um, they decided that more people should enjoy these cherry blossoms. So they transplanted those trees to temples and parks. And Hideyoshi was um, famous for throwing these lavish parties, inviting 5,000 people. And uh, there would be poetry readings. That was a really big thing back then. Theater performances, and of course, a lot of drinking. <laughs> and even today, when Japanese people observe hanami, which means to observe the flowers. The friends and families, they'll gather and wherever there are cherry blossoms in a park or near a temple, and they'll share a nice meal, maybe lay out a picnic tarp. And of course, they'll get some cold cans of beer from the <laughs> convenience store and they'll enjoy their time together. So, you know, that's kind of the history. It took a millennia for the cherry blossoms to make their way from the mountains to 
a place where anyone can enjoy them on a casual basis. And I think it's important to appreciate that, that history. All right, so let's get into the first book, The Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu. She was born in the year 973, oh my goodness. And this book is celebrated actually as the world's first recorded novel. And let's also take a moment to appreciate that the first recorded novel was written by a woman. She was a lady in waiting in the imperial court and she wrote this book. It spans a thousand plus pages about the life and romantic life of Prince Genji. And it spans from his youth adolescence, adulthood, it actually doesn't even stop at his death. It keeps going to his descendants' lives. So, you know, this really, I, I admit, I have this book. I read it from time to time, just little snippets. I have not read the whole thing, and you don't need to. I will just read you some excerpts from it tonight so that you can appreciate some of um, the cherry blossom mentions in here. But what's really incredible about this is that, um, you know, it has been celebrated and preserved for this long and people still dissect it. It's sort of like the way people talk about the Odyssey or the Iliad or, you know, it's, it's like that of Japan. So if you're gonna think about Japanese literature, this is where you start. And um, I'm just gonna read, let's see, is there anything else I need to mention? There's many editions of this too. There's abridged versions that are a little bit thinner. <laughs> so you don't have to read this big one. But I'm gonna read to you and excuse me for my sore throat today, I have a bad case of seasonal allergies. Uh, as much as I like spring, I don't love the allergies. But part eight, under the cherry blossoms. His majesty held a party to honor the cherry tree before the imperial palace. It was a lovely day with a bright sky and bird song to gladden the heart. When those who prided themselves on their skill, princes, senior nobles and all, drew their rhymes and began composing verses. As usual, Genji's very voice announcing, I have received the spirit of spring, resembled no other. His majesty had, of course, arranged the dances perfectly. The one about the warbler in spring was charming as sunset approached, and after it, the heir apparent, who remembered Genji under the autumn leaves, gave him his own blossom headdress and urged him to dance again. Genji, who could not refuse, rose and with casual ease went through the part where the dancer tosses his sleeves. The effect was incomparable. The minister forgot all his displeasures and wept. Skipping forward a little bit. The cherry blossom season was over, but two of His Excellency's trees must have consented to wait, for they were in late and glorious bloom. He had had his recently rebuilt residence specially decorated for the princesses donning of their long kimonos. Everything was in the latest style, in consonance with His Excellency's own florid taste. Genji dressed with great care, and the sun had set by the time he arrived to claim his welcome. He wore a grape-colored train robe under a cherry blossom dress cloak of sheer figured silk. Among the formal cloaks worn by everyone else, his costume displayed the extravagant elegance of a prince and his grand entry was a sensation. The very blossoms were abashed and the gathering took some time to regain its animation. He played beautifully and it was quite late by the time he left again on the pretext of having drunk so much that he was not well. So that's a little glimpse into this world. Imagine a thousand years ago when these you know, emperors and princes and the people around him, they were just there with their you know, thick, beautiful kimonos of silk and they were enjoying the cherry blossoms in their very exclusive world, right? That's the world that we're in. And that's where the cherry blossoms and appreciating them really started. Um, in terms of that line about having drunk so much that he was not well, I was thinking my father, who lives in Tokyo, he likes to say that hanami, or you know, this celebration of cherry blossoms, is just an excuse to drink in public. <laughs> He's not really wrong. The next book I'll be discussing is The Makioka Sisters by Jun Ichiro Tanizaki. This book was written in the early 1940s, so actually during the war. Um, the novel spans the lives of four sisters 
in Osaka, which is the southern region of Japan. You might even think of it as the Nashville of Japan. Um, and the book actually, the, it takes place between the years 1936 through 1941. So five years right up to the beginning of the war. The Japanese title of this book is Sasame Yuki, which means lightly falling snow. And this actually, you might think, oh, that sounds wintry, but that is a calling back to classical Japanese literature. You see, so Junichiro Tanizaki, he was a writer who was obsessed with the tale of Genji. And in fact, in his book and uh, in her book and also in other works of Japanese literature, whenever people talked about the falling of snow, what they were really talking about was the falling of cherry blossom petals. It was a metaphor. And so this book, The Makioka Sisters, Lightly Falling Snow, that immediately for Japanese readers, they're going to think cherry blossoms. And the novel spans five years. The sisters take an annual pilgrimage to Kyoto from Osaka just to view the cherry blossoms. It's their special thing. It's their special ritual. And other things happen. Um, this book reminds me a lot of Little Women or Pride and Prejudice, in that it's also a story about four sisters. Unlike those books, this book is very tragic. It does not have a happy ending. But these women are so resilient, and there's no good or bad character. Everyone is just very human. And if you have siblings, you, know, you might be able to think, oh, that's what my older sister was like, or my younger sister. There's a lot of universal things in here. But when we think about women in the 30s, their survival depended on who they married. And the Makioka family in the story, uh, they used to be very prominent in Osaka. And they had a really great reputation. But they're you know, in this new world where technology is rapidly changing and women are you know, starting to like, listen to like foreign music and discovering different sides of themselves. And then there's older sisters in this family that are like, no, we need to stick to the old ways. The younger sisters, they want to rebel. They want to marry who they love, no matter what his status is. There's a lot of tension. There's a lot of personal strife that's also caused by what's going on in the world. It's a fascinating glimpse into that time period. And this translation does it so well. Um, it's, it's a great read. Um, so. Yes, he was very much influenced by the tale of Genji to the point where this author, he wrote a translation of the tale of Genji in modern Japanese so that more people could appreciate the tale of Genji. So you could see influences here. So I'm going to read a little excerpt from the Makioka sisters. This is from um, a trip they take to Kyoto to see the cherry blossoms. You don't need to remember the names, just kind of focus on the descriptions of the flowers and the ritual, and I hope you'll enjoy. Excuse me. When Sachiko was asked what flower she liked best, there was no hesitation in her answer, the cherry blossom. All these hundreds of years, from the days of the oldest poetry collections, there have been poems about cherry blossoms. The ancients waited for cherry blossoms, grieved when they were gone, and lamented their passing in countless poems. How very ordinary the poems had seemed to her when she read them as a girl, but now she knew, as well as one could know, that grieving over fallen cherry blossoms was more than a fad or a convention. The family, Sachiko, her husband and daughter, her two younger sisters, had for some years now been going to Kyoto in the spring to see the cherry blossoms. The excursion had become a fixed annual observance. Sometimes, Tenosuke or Etsuko would be missing because of work or school, or at least, but at least the three sisters were always together. For Sachiko, there was, besides pleasant sorrow for the cherry blossoms, sorrow for her sisters, and the passing of their youth, she wondered whether each excursion might not be her last, with Yukiko at least. And her sisters seemed to feel much the same emotions. Not as fond of cherry blossoms as Sachiko, they still took great pleasure in the outing. Long before, at the time of the spring festival in Nara, early in March, they began waiting for it and planning what they would wear. 
As the season approached, there would be reports on when the cherries were likely to be in full bloom. They had to pick, pick a weekend for the convenience of Etsuko and Tenosuke, and they all had the anxiety of the ancients over the weather, anxiety which had once seemed to Sachiko merely conventional. With each breeze and each shower, their concern for the cherries would grow. There were cherries enough around the Ashia house and cherries to be seen from the window of the train to Osaka, and there was no need to go all the way to Kyoto, but Sachiko had firm views on what was best. When it came to sea bream, only akashi bream seemed worth eating, and she felt that she had not seen the cherry blossoms at all unless she went to Kyoto. Tenosuke had rebelled the year before and taken them instead to some bridge, but Sachiko had been restless afterwards, as though she had forgotten something. She complained that spring did not feel like spring and finally took Tanosuke off to Kyoto just in time for the late cherries. The annual procedure was fixed. They arrived in Kyoto on Saturday afternoon, had an early dinner at a restaurant, and after the spring dances, which they never missed, they saw the Gion cherries by lantern light. On Sunday morning, they went to the western suburbs after lunch by the river, they returned to the city in time to see the weeping cherries in the Heian Shrine. And with that, whether or not Tenosuke and Sachiko stayed on another night by themselves, the outing proper was finished. The cherries in the Heian Shrine were left to the last because they, of all the cherries in Kyoto, were the most beautiful. Now that they were great weeping cherries and Gion was dying and its blossoms were growing paler each year, what was left to stand for the Kyoto Spring if not the cherries in the Heian Shrine? And so, coming back from the western suburbs of that afternoon in the second day and picking that moment of regret when the spring sun was about to set, they would pause a little tired under the trailing branches and look fondly at each tree on around the lake by the approach to a bridge by abandoning the path under the eaves of the gallery. And until the cherries came the following year, they could close their eyes and see again the color and line of a trailing branch. Choosing a weekend in mid-April, they set out. Etsuko put on a kimono, scarcely 10 times a year, and would have been uncomfortable in any case. She was wearing a kimono a little too small for her. An intent expression on her holiday face, it was touched up very slightly with cosmetics. She concentrated on keeping her sandals from slipping off and her kimono from coming open. At dinner, a bare knee finally slipped through. She was clearly more at home in Western clothes. She still had her own childish way of holding chopsticks, moreover, and the kimono sleeves seemed to get in her way. When a particularly slippery vegetable shot out from the chopsticks, slithered across the veranda and came to rest in the moss outside, she was as pleased as the rest. The year's expedition was off to a good start. The next morning, they strolled first of all along the banks of the Hirosawa Pond. Tenosuke took a picture with his Leica of the four of them. Sachiko, Etsuko, Yukiko, and Taiko lined up in that order under a cherry tree whose branches trailed off into the water. They had a happy memory of the spot. One spring, as they had been walking along the pond, a gentleman had asked them most politely if he might take their picture. Writing down their address, he promised to send prints if the snapshots turned out well. And among the prints that arrived some 10 days later was a truly remarkable one. Sachiko and Etsuko turned away from the camera, were looking out over the rippled surface of the lake from under the same cherry tree, and the two wrapped figures, mother and daughter, with cherry petals falling on the gay kimono of the little girl, seemed the very incarnation of regret for the passing of spring. Ever since, they had made it a point to stand under the same tree and look out over the pond and have their picture taken. Sachiko knew, too, that in the hedge that lined the path, there would be camellia loaded with crimson blossoms. She never forgot to look for it. You can kind of get a sense of her personality here. She's very type A. She needs everything to be perfect. Skipping down a little bit. Let's see. These weeping cherries just beyond the gallery to the left as one steps inside the gate and faces the main hall. Those cherries said to be famous, famous even abroad. How would they be this year? Was it perhaps already too late? Always they stepped through the gallery with a strange rising of the heart, but the five of them cried out as one when they saw that cloud of pink spread across the late afternoon sky. It was the climax of the pilgrimage, the moment treasured through a whole year. 
all was well. They had come again to the cherries in full bloom. There was a feeling of relief and a hope that next year might be as fortunate. And for Sachiko, at least, the thought that even if she herself stood here next year, Yukiko might be married and far away. The flowers would come again, but Yukiko would not. It was a saddening thought, and yet it contained almost a prayer that for Yukiko's sake, she might indeed no longer be with them. Sachiko had stood under these same trees with these same emotions the year before and the year before that. And each time she had found it hard to understand why they should still be together. She could not bear to look at Yukiko. The willows and oaks beyond the cherry grove were sending out new buds. The oleanders had been clipped into round balls. Sending, sending the four ahead, Tainosuke photographed them at the usual spots, at the pond, near the shore, near the stones. He had them line up under the truly glorious branches that trailed down over the path from the pine-topped hillocks of the west of the pond of the nesting phoenix. All sorts of strangers took pictures of the Makioka procession. The polite would carefully ask permission. The rude would simply snap. There the family had had tea. Here they had fed the red carp. They remembered the smallest details of earlier pilgrimages. Makioka sisters, highly recommend. So we went from the imperial gardens where it was very exclusive. 20th century, it's a little bit more open to the public and families like the Makioka family, they can make it a point to go somewhere, look at them and make it a, as perfect as possible and need it to be perfect, right? Now we're gonna move on to the 21st century and The Housekeeper and the Professor, this is a novel that was written in 2003. So The Housekeeper and the Professor. I spoke about this actually in one of the reading between the lines. So if you wanna hear me ramble on about this one, it's on YouTube. Today I'll just talk a little bit about the part that talks about the cherry blossoms and you can even see on the cover cherry blossoms. So Yoko Ogawa, she is a brilliant novelist. A lot of her books are very dark and very, let's say, pessimistic a little bit about humanity. This one is actually a feel-good novel. It will make you feel warm and cozy inside, if that's your thing. Um, let's see. The context of this, this, is a very, this has a very simple premise. There's three characters. There's the housekeeper, she's a single mom, and she has a son who's about 10 years old. He's in elementary school. And then the professor, he's just named the professor. You don't even get his real name in here. Housekeeper, her son, and the professor, that's all you need to know. The professor though, he's a mathematics professor and he's retired, he's very old. And he's brilliant, but he has something unique. He was in a car accident and ever since his memory only lasts 80 minutes at a time. So every 80 minutes it refreshes and he doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know where he is. So what the professor does is he puts all these post-its around his suit that say things like, this is your name. Uh, you got into a car accident. Your memory only lasts 80 minutes. You have a housekeeper. She's not a stranger. And he has all these notes around him and he's very reclusive, you can imagine. And he has not been able to keep a housekeeper because everyone thinks he's too weird to work with and he has a really bad temperament. But this starts off with this housekeeper going in and she's like, oh gosh, like, am I, how, how long am I gonna last? But they develop this beautiful friendship. And I'm gonna read um, from chapter, I believe this is chapter three. So we're still towards the beginning, but um, excuse me. All you need to know is that um, the housekeeper, she's kind of used to him now and she's been cleaning his house just fine, and she wants to take him on an outing. And it's from her perspective. I finally managed to get the professor out of the house. Since I'd come to work, he had not so much as set foot in the garden, let alone gone for a real outing, and I thought some fresh air would be good for him. It's beautiful outside today, I said, coaxing him. It makes you wanna go out, get some sun. The professor was ensconced in his easy chair with a book. Why don't we take a walk in the park and then stop in a barber shop? And why would we do that? He said, glancing up at me over his reading glasses. No particular reason. The cherry blossoms are just over in the park and the dogwood is about to bloom and a haircut might feel nice. Mm -hmm. I feel fine like this. A walk would get your circulation going and that might help you come up with some good formulas. There's no connection between the arteries in the legs and the ones in the head. 
Well, you'd be much handsomer if you took care of your hair. Waste of time, he said. But eventually, my persistence got the better of him, and he closed his book. The only shoes in the cupboard by the door were old leather ones covered in a thin layer of mold. You'll stay with me, he asked several times as I was cleaning them off. You can't just leave me while I'm having my hair cut and come home. Don't worry, I'll stay with you the whole time. No matter how much I polished, the shoes were still dull. I wasn't sure what to do with the notes the professor had clipped all over his body. If we left them on, people were bound to stare. But since he didn't seem to care, I decided to leave them alone. The professor marched along, staring down at his feet without a glance at the blue sky overhead or the sights we passed along the way. The walk did not seem to relax him. He was more tense than usual. Look, I'd say, the cherry blossoms are in full bloom. But he only muttered to himself. Out in the open air, he seemed somehow older. We decided to go to the barber shop first. The barber recoiled at the sight of the professor's strange suit, but he turned out to be a kind man. He realized quickly that there must be a reason for the notes, and after that, he treated the professor like any other customer. You're lucky to have your daughter with you, he said, assuming we were related. Neither of us corrected him. I sat on the sofa with the men waiting in line for their haircuts. I'm going to skip down a little bit, a little bit. After the barber shop, we sat on a bench in the park and drank a can of coffee. There was a sandbox nearby and a fountain and some tennis courts. When the wind blew, the petals from the cherry trees floated around us, and the dappled sunlight danced on the professor's face. The notes on his jacket fluttered restlessly, and he stared down into the can as if he'd been given some mysterious potion. I was right. You look handsome and more manly. That's quite enough of that, said the professor. For once, he smelled of shaving cream rather than of paper. Oh, so sweet. Um, <laughs> before, I, before I wrap up, oh, hello, hello. This is my little one. Um, before we wrap up, so those were the three books. And I just, you know, I think these are such great examples of, you know, the time periods in Japan. Would you mind sitting with Dada, actually? <laughs> I'll be right there. We're wrapping up. There are great examples of three different time periods in Japan, different ways that people interacted with cherry blossoms. And as you look around in Nashville at the cherry blossoms here, I want you to be reminded of where they first came from, up in the mountains of Japan where only a few people could see them. And then the imperial courts where only the top one percenters could see them. And then the temples where you had to make an excursion and now it's everywhere. I mean, that's a pretty incredible deal. And then I was also thinking about the word transplant, too, because that's a word that they use to describe these trees that have been carried from place to place. And I feel like Nashville being a growing city, I'm a transplant, too. I'm not from here originally. But, you know, um, I want to respect where I am and not, you know, be an invasive species, so to speak. <laughs> but I do think there's something kind of wonderful that happens when different cultures come together, just like what jazz does. And you know, if you don't see the cherry blossoms today, you can still appreciate the festivities. And please be sure to check out the Cherry Blossom Festival that's hosted by JAST and the Japanese Consulate on Saturday, April 13th at Public Square. Thank you so much for listening to me. And um, I can take a few minutes for questions, but I think we're going to wrap up in a minute. So thank you. Did uh, anybody want to ask a question to Yurina before we wrap up? Yeah, sure. So the handmade uh, writing of the book of Genji, was that kind of weird or was that? Oh, like the women writing a book, you mean? Yeah, that... That's a very interesting question. So during this time, um, the men wrote in Chinese characters. The women were able to write, but they had to use different kinds of characters called hiragana. And the men were kind of like, you can write your little things, you know, just don't use our way of writing. And that's what happened. That's you know, this lady in waiting. And there's another writer named Sei Shonagon, who was also a contemporary of hers, who wrote the pillow books. Those are really good, too. But um, the women wrote. They wrote. And it was not taboo, because they were just given that container and that permission. And I, in fact, I think that was you know, the men thought they were just putting the woman away in a closet or something, like, do your own thing. But it turned out to be such a gift. You know? So great question. Anyone else? Yes, Lisa. Is there a mention of cherry blossoms in the pillow book? 
Yes, there are, and I was thinking of using that one too, but I went with The Tale of Genji instead. Again, if you allow me to go on and on, I have like <laughs> six other books I could have brought in here, but um, yes, yes, there are, and I can share them with you if you like. Anyone else? Yeah. I wonder if you could have any other recommendations about you know, appreciating this point the role of translating. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would check out, there are some wonderful book publishers that focus specifically on translated literature. Um, I'm thinking like Europa Books. Um, they are a publisher um, that only really puts out translated books. And that's how I've discovered, for example, one of my favorite writers, Elena Ferrante. She's Italian, and I would have never been able to appreciate her if it weren't for that publisher. And they do all, all the countries of the world. And I think just um, browsing you know, in a bookshop too and um, seeing you know, where it was originated and just going from there. And I, like, I really do think the translators are doing such fantastic work that um, you, you can really trust and lean on them to like, give you what you need to, to, to read it. Give Yurina a hand one more time, please. <laughs> and we had a, a great cameo from Yurina's husband, yes. Jen, and two very special guests. What are, what are their, na their names? Oh, they're Ray and Hal. Okay, yes. awesome. That was, that was tremendous. Um, I want to note that um, our friend John here is recording this. This will be on our Jast YouTube channel probably tomorrow. Uh, one great way to support Yurina might be to take that video and share it on your Facebook or your Twitter, um, whatever the other ones are called. I'm out of date. Um, I, I want to thank one more time Jaime from Mitsui and Company. The Mitsui USA Foundation is so generous to support events like this. And I want to thank this incredible venue, uh, the bookshop. Normally I'm not cool enough to come to East Nashville, but I, I make an exception in this case. I'll, I'll, I'll come back and uh, for sure bring my family. They're, the bookshop's going to close at 730 so if you haven't yet, um, run over there and pick something up and, and support these guys. I know we've talked a lot about the importance of local bookstores. They're behind the eight ball in so many ways these days, so I know they'd appreciate it if you supported them. Um, and finally, we have a lot of food that I don't want to take home. Enjoy. So dig into that. Uh, and with that, we'll adjourn. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Thanks. Thank you.